Hello! This video talks about evolutionary family trees. You've likely seen one. They mostly show up in textbooks. You might also see one on TV or in a museum. This one has photographs taken millions of years ago. Well, needless to say, that's not true. It does raise a question of what exactly we are then looking at. Since nobody was there taking photos, there is no way to prove or disprove these. So we are getting outside the realm of science. Take a moment to look at the names and paths. Here is another one. This is more reasonable in that it shows fossil remains which have been found, drawings of them anyway. A photo would be ideal because we don't know if a drawing accurately reflects the genuine article in shape and size. Ernest Haeckel's embryo drawings taught us a thing or two about that, and we wouldn't want to go down that primrose path again, would we? The names seem to agree, but there are differences in the branching. For instance, Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus boisei are shown coming from Australopithecus africanus here, whereas here they are shown both coming off Paranthropus ethiopicus. It would be complicated and time-consuming for me to dissect them both completely for differences, but you get the idea. Both trees have branches that are indicated in some fashion as being tentative by using dashes or question marks. The implication of that would be that the authors are 100% sure about the other branches. However, we've just shown differences in those quote-unquote certain branches. I really wonder whether the average textbook reader takes the time to look at them with any scrutiny, or just draws an overall impression from them being there and looking rather detailed. Here is a third family tree, this time with photos of unaged complete skulls. Its time frame and names are generally the same as the rest. We again see branching, with some inconsistencies throughout. Let's trace this third tree a little to see how these things work. We see it start six or more million years ago with Australopithecus anamensis, who is not depicted, presumably because of unsuitable amount or no remains to show. From there, it branches in two directions, arriving at the right with Kenyanthropus platyops two million years later, where the branch dead ends. At the left, 1.5 million years later, we reach Australopithecus afarensis. From there, we branch in three directions to Australopithecus africanus, another dead end, Australopithecus garhi, and Paranthropus ethiopicus, all at about three million years ago. Paranthropus ethiopicus branches to Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus boisei, which both did end one million years later. Australopithecus garhi transitions through Homo habilis to Homo ergaster, also about one million years later. Homo ergaster branches in three directions, two of which are dead ends. Homo floresiensis, two million years later, and Homo erectus, one million years later. The third direction leads to Homo heidelbergensis one and a half million years later, or a half million years ago. Homo heidelbergensis branches in two directions, to Homo neanderthalensis, which died out recently, relatively speaking, and to Homo sapiens, which continues to present. You will have noted along the way the gradual progression from protruding brow to flat brow, brain cavity enlarging and shifting from behind to above the face, the gradual recession from a large and protruding jawbone, and so forth. There are variations in these characteristics between the branches of the tree. Indeed, branches are differentiated from one another by the fact that some are characterized by a specially protruding frontal face, large jawbone, large browed protrusion, etc. I must admit this evolutionary family tree makes pretty compelling persuasion for believing in the theory of evolution due to its level of detail and specificity. There is an air of professionalism to its layout, and it asserts a high degree of certainty. Would you not agree? At the same time, I can tell you that what it purports to show is an utter misrepresentation of the truth. It is, in fact, a complete sham. I can tell you this because I am the one who made it. All of these images shown are of present-day living things, commercially available plastic replicas purchasable for use in classrooms. It was easy to substitute them into the layout of an evolutionary family tree because they look just the same. In fact, 
The face value conclusion is that they look the same because they are the same. Humans, chimps, monkeys, apes, gorillas, langurs, orangutans, which we are contemporary with, have died in the past. So when we dig up fossils, we should expect them to include these creatures. If evolutionists want to arrange fossils in a way to appear like a gradual transition, these provide a plethora to choose from. Besides which, we are witnessing in real time animals become extinct, so fossils document an even more generous selection to choose from. On top of this, there is variation from age, gender, health condition, herd, tribe, individual to individual, fragmented fossil misassembly, extrapolation from limited remains to cover missing portions, and finally additional pure artistic license. So let's look back over the tree now, unveiling what the members actually are, and making observations along the way. Gone are the evolutionary names. And let's remember, just because something has been named doesn't mean it exists. How many thousands or millions were taught about the Brontosaurus when such a creature never existed? You can check on your own how the remains were mixed and attached in the wrong places. So these creatures actually are Patmos monkey, Bornean orangutan, Chakma baboon twice. Look how completely different these are due to age. We will have more to say about that. Hanuman langur, velvet monkey, Siamang ape, bonobo chimpanzee, lowland gorilla, Australian aborigine, American Indian, Asian mongoloid, Asian male, European female. Look at the bone structure differences between contemporary humans, protrusion of the brow, forehead, and jaw. So the evolutionary premise is that the more upright the posture, recess the jaw, high in protruding the forehead, flat the brow, the more advanced. Or to address what the theory of evolution actually needs to answer, the more base pairs in a genome. So why is that? I certainly know smarter big-browed people than small-browed, small-forehead people than big, meat-eating people than vegetarian, don't you? As the DNA strand gets longer from all those base pairs, does it need more space in the skull? Does it need closer to the sun to stay warm? Does it take more energy from the organism to produce the longer DNA molecule, thus less energy is left to grow the jaw and brow? Silly, isn't that? The notion there is an inherent connection between these features and the extent to which the genome has supposedly self-written? The perception of these traits being connected to how advanced, or smart, or capable, or sophisticated, or all importantly, how large its genome is, are a style started by evolutionists. They are like fins on a 57 Chevy. They resemble wings on an airplane, and airplanes are fast. So to certain people, the fins make the car look fast. The car may have highly modified powertrain and running gear and cover the quarter mile in six seconds. The car may have no engine under the hood in a wrecking yard and be incapable of motion. Both cars look fast to people who perceive the fins that way, but the fins told us zero about whether the car was fast or not. Additional proof these features are unrelated to size of genome can be seen in their variation between genders, races, and ages. Here are a couple illustrations. Look at this Roman gladiator. He lived 1500 to 2000 years ago. But get a load of that forehead. He's off the end of the evolutionary family tree. He's probably evolved telepathic powers. He's probably beyond totally upright and walks bent over backwards. Look at adult and child chimpanzee and orangutan side by side. Look at the forehead, the jaw, the brow. The same creature begins life highly advanced and a few years forward in time has devolved millions of years backward. Look at this comparison between Caucasian and African skulls. There is no connection between jaw or forehead and intelligence or advancement. The evolutionary claim in this regard is patently racist. There is nothing else we can say. Let's look at this in accordance with the fundamentals of the scientific method. The scientific method deals with independent, dependent, and control variables. The evolutionary sub-theory here is that the independent variable of genome size correlates to dependent variables of jaw, brow, and forehead morphology. You've just realized that these variables of age, gender, health condition, herd, tribe, 
and individual to individual are known to correlate to jaw, brow, and forehead morphology. Therefore, these are control variables which must be held the same for any attempt to prove the stated evolutionary theory. Are they? When we hear evolutionary family tree, which one are we being shown? The five-year-old female dwarfism top 10 percentile? Have you ever seen an evolutionary family tree label like that? No. Then it is useless for claiming that millions of years caused a gradual progression between these organisms. Is it even possible to make such a scientific family tree to control these variables? No. We don't know from a fossil how old the organism was, how to group corresponding ages of organism with differing and unknown lifespans, of corresponding health condition for organisms of which we don't know what illnesses it had or what illnesses existed it could have had, how to correlate tribe and race when there is no corresponding entity, or how to state what percentile it was in for individual to individual variation. There is no proof whatsoever for the evolutionary theory that genome size correlates to jaw, brow, and forehead morphology. But I don't even want to leave it at that. When you look at fangs, opposed toes, knuckle-walking hip orientation, locking knees, arms overhead shoulder joints, curved fingers, you have so many overlooked differences between these simian animals and man, and no evidence one gradually changed into the other. However, the difference between simian animals and man is not just physiological. An animal could be built just like a man and still would not design buildings, cars, airplanes, and computers, compose symphonies, write books, make movies, set up courts, etc. Because animals are not made in the image and likeness of God, but man is. We see this in the world we live in. The difference between man and animals is not just physical, it is spiritual. In addition to all the ways I've pointed out, one can fabricate a smooth transition between creatures which have always been separate. A further one has to do with how broken skull remains are put together when all the pieces on hand do belong to the same organism. Evolutionists make much of brain cavity volume, which I've shown is irrelevant anyway. But if one wants to cause this volume to gradually increase when it actually doesn't, there are certainly ways to do that. If we have just a few surviving fragments, we can easily get the volume we want out of them since we make up the balance of the skull which supposedly had been between the fragments. But even when all the fragments are present, volume is still easy to adjust. To illustrate, all these rectangles have the same perimeter but very different areas. The effect of aspect ratio on volume is even larger than this effect on area, being a cubed or third power effect. We can look at the same effect of aspect ratio on ellipses and realize the volume can further be manipulated by putting dents in the outside perimeter. If I need a 2%, 5%, 10% adjustment to volume to make a skull fit where I want it to, that is a piece of cake. The adjustment is so small nobody would ever notice. Lastly, consider the artistic resources available today which routinely make things which are not real look as though they were. Think Jurassic Park, Transformers, Star Wars. The list is endless. The technology was quite refined before CGI, and computers have made additional things possible and brought the technique accessible to more people. Realize also that like those in Hollywood whose fare is recognized as fiction, those making these evolutionary trees are making a living doing so. So not only do they have the technology on hand, they also have time and money being taken care of. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video informative and enlightening.